no future for the workplace. The best future for the workplace, as for the battlefield, is no future at all. With belated notice taken of a crisis in the workplace, the consultants surge forth with faddish reforms, whose common denominator is that they excite little interest in the workplace itself. Done to, not won by, the workers, their tinkerings are very much business as usual for business as usual. They may raise productivity temporarily till the novelty wears off, but fiddling with the who, what, when, and where of work doesn't touch the source of the malaise. Why work? Changing the place of work to the home is like moving from Albania to Somalia in search of a better life. Flex time is, as the Microsoft Office joke goes, for professionals who can work any 60 hours a week they want to. It's not for the service sector where the greatest numbers toil. It will not do for fry cooks who flex their time at the lunch hour nor bus drivers at rush hour. Job enrichment is part pep rally, part painkiller, uplift, and aspirin. Even workers' control, which most North American managers find unthinkable, is only self-managed servitude. Like letting prisoners elect their own guards. For Western employees, glasnost and uh, perestroika, uh, perestroika uh, how soon we forgot those unforgettable words, uh, are too little and too late. Measures that would have been applauded by the 19th and 20th century socialist and anarchist militants. Indeed, it was from them that the consultants cribbed them. At best, now meet with sullen indifference. And at worst, are taken as signs of weakness. Especially from North American bosses, relatively backward in their management style, as in most other ways, concessions would only arouse expectations. They cannot fulfill and still remain in charge. The democracy movements worldwide have swept aside the small fry. The only enemy is the common enemy. The workplace is the last bastion of authoritarian coercion. Disenchantment with work runs as deeply here as did disenchantment with communism in Eastern Europe. Indeed, many were not all that enchanted with either of them in the first place. Why did they submit? Why do we? Because, as individuals... We have no choice. There's far more evidence of a revolt against work than there had ever been a revolt against communism. Were it otherwise, there would be no market for tranquilizers like job redesign, job enrichment, the quality of working life, etc. The worker at work, as to a tragic extent off the job, is passive aggressive. Not for him, and especially not for her. The collective solidarity heroics of labor's storied past. But absenteeism, job jumping, embezzlement of goods and services, self-sedation with drink or drugs, and the effort so perfunctory that it may cross the line to count as sabotage. These are the ways the little fish emulate the big fish, who, flush from peddling junk bonds, loot savings, and loan associations, and extending home loans indiscriminately, let government bail them out if they can't collect they triumphantly downsize, outsource, and Toyotaize, along with new requisitions and repressions which await their neologis neologisms. What if there were a general strike, and it proved permanent because it made no demands? It was already the satisfaction of all demands. There was a time when the unions would have thwarted anything like that, but they don't count anymore. Someday the bosses may miss them. The future belongs to the zero work movement. The revolt against work. Should one well up, unless its object, object is impossible because the work is inevitable. Do not even the, con, uh, do not even the consultants and the techno-futurologists take work and so much else for granted. Indeed they do, which is reason enough to be skeptical. They never yet foresaw a future which came to pass. They prophesized moving sidewalks and single-family air cars, not computers or recombinant DNA. Their Amer the American century was Japanese before it was half over. Futurologists are always wrong because they're always only extrapolators. The limit of their vision is more of the same. 
Although history, the record of previous futures, the graveyard of previous predictions, is replete with discontinuities, which with surprises like the personal computer, try to find it anticipated in any science fiction. Or Eastern Europe, try to find any academic and or intelligence community anticipations of the imminent demise of communism. Attend to the utopians instead. The difference between the utopians and the futurologists is the difference between more of the same and something different. Since the utopians believe life could be different, and it will, what they say just might be true. Work, referring to what workers do, should not be confused with exertion. Work, in the physicist's sense, play can be more strenuous than work. In a social sense, work is compulsory production, something done for some other reason than the satisfaction of doing it. That other might, reason might be violence, in the case of slavery, dearth, in the case of unemployment, or an internalized compulsion, the Calvinist's calling, the Buddhist's right livelihood. Unlike the play impulse, none of these motives even maximizes our productive potential. Work is not very productive. Although production is its only justification. Enter the consultants with their toys. Although it does not have to be play, uh, although it does not have to be, play can be productive. So forced labor may not be necessary. When we work, we produce without pleasure, so as to consume without creating. Containers drained and filled, drained and filled, drained and filled, like the locks of a canal. Job enrichment? The phrase implies a prior condition of job impoverishment, which debunks the myth of work as a source of wealth. Work devalues life by appropriating something so priceless it cannot be bought back no matter how high the GMP is. Life enrichment, on the other hand, consists of the suppression of many jobs and the recreation, in every sense, of the others as activities intrinsically enjoyable. If not to everyone, for any length of time, then for some, at some times in some circumstances. Work standardizes people as it does products. But since people by nature strive to produce themselves, work wastes effort lost to conflict and stress. Play is pluralistic, bringing into play the full panoply of talents and passions, submerged by work and anesthetized by leisure. The work world frowns on job jumping. The play-oriented or letic life encourages hobby hopping. As their work conditioning wears off, more and more people will feel more and more aptitudes and appetites unfolding like the colorful wings of a brand new butterfly, and the letic mode of production will be more firmly consolidated. You say you love your job. Fine. Keep doing it. Your sort will help to tide us over during the transition. We feel sorry for you, but respect your choice as much as we suspect that it's rooted in your refusal to admit that your present prodigious efforts made life, especially yours, no better. They only made life seem to go by faster. You were coping in your own way. You were hurrying to get it over with. With the abolition of work, the economy is, in effect, abolished also. Replacing today's Teamsters hauling freight will be welcome wagons, visiting friends and bearing gifts. Why go to the trouble to buy and sell? Too much paperwork. Too much work. Although the consultants are inept as reformers, they might make magnificent revolutionaries. They rethink work, whereas workers want to think about anything but. But... They must rethink their own jobs first. For them to transfer their loyalties to the workers might not be too difficult. It's expedient to join the winning side, after all. But they will find it harder to acknowledge that, in the end, the experts on work are the workers who do it, and especially the workers who refuse to. <laughs>